we are in an incredibly difficult economic landscape. The news coming through the pipes um, is more and more worrying. We hear just this week about a number of uh, layoffs, retrenchments from large corporations. Uh, the bigger economic prints are troubling. And this against a backdrop of 2024, a very big election year where we will get a whole bunch of new promises thrown at us, mixed in with some interesting acronyms um, and promises about uh, a healthcare system, uh, about reform in the pension uh, structures, the, the so-called two pots, which promises us a dip at our pension money next year. Uh, that's a great way to get political support. Uh, and then brand new acronyms, JIFRA. He'll tell us about that. So uh, that's, uh, that's the backdrop. And the conversation, uh, for, for this conversation, absolutely fantastic panel. Uh, Busi Mabusa, the uh, CEO of BLSA. Henny Heymans, the CEO of DHL. Gina Skuman, the Chief Economist uh, at Citigroup. And Stavros Nikolaou, who looks after policy for Aspen Pharma Care uh, across the world and right back from Zambia late last night, early this morning. Late last night. Late last night. Gina, uh, also late last night, finished your economic outlook. So you, that doesn't escape. Right. A business leader, a CEO, an economist, and a doctor walk into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> But there's nothing funny about the South African economy or where we find ourselves. So let me use that as the jump off point, Gina. Your 9 p.m. print. <laughs> My 9 p.m. ideas um, from last night. Yeah. Look, I think, let's put this a bit in context of the global environment we're finding ourselves in. There's always uncertainty. I, I, I can't think of a year where we felt certain going into a year. I think those days are long behind us. Um, you know, we are certainly going to see a lot of headwinds coming from that side, particularly from the US. But I think globally, you know, you've got some bigger trends that won't just be a 2024 story, but will extend beyond that too. They do threaten to bring inflation with them. So climate change and everything to do with climate change on a long-term cycle, there are more fears about this being more inflationary than not. Then you also have, of course, your supply side shifts around the world as deglobalization starts to you know, move around. Um, and that's also seen as a threat to inflation. You know, I was in Marrakesh um, at the IMF World Bank um, meetings uh, not so, so long ago. And it was very interesting sitting with you know, macro-minded people from various countries around the world. And while there are such vast differences at the moment between regions and countries around the world. I mean, even just looking at the Euro area and the US and the economic cycles there, the one thing in common was the fact that central bankers are all very cautious, which makes sense to me if you think about it. If you have been a central banker over the last four years, the number of supply side shocks that have come and hit you unexpectedly and cause inflation to rise when you actually thought inflation would start declining, you know, that, that, is, that is still very fresh in all of our minds. And where I'm going with all of this is that, you know, these things do not leave a small open economy like South Africa unscathed. So while all of that is happening in the backdrop, and I haven't even mentioned geopolitics globally, because of course, that's now entered our political discussion. It's not now just about local elections in South Africa. It's also about South Africa faring its way around the geopolitical stage having gone through the Russia-US debacle, and now also getting involved vocally um, in what's happening in the Middle East with Israel. So, you know, geopolitics is also something we cannot separate from our story. And all of that together is against an economy that just hasn't grown. I mean, you know, we can try and say some years were better because of commodity prices, but if this economy had actually grown over the last decade, our real per capita growth would have shown it and the ANC would probably not be in as desperate a position as it is right now because we would have done reform. So I'm not saying there isn't a little bit of a glimmer of hope next year. There is, 
And I think anyone who's ever heard me speak before will know that I, I label myself realistically bearish or, or just realistic. Um, next year will, for some, in some ways, look better for South Africa because we I really want to touch wood when I say this, but we really shouldn't have the same level of load shedding next year as we did this year. And that creates a nice base effect. Mm -hmm. and, and if you watch upcoming prints in growth, we need to ensure that the investment growth we saw in Q2, because renewables, continues because when, and I also want to touch wood when I say this, when inflation comes down next year, and the, the South Africa Reserve Bank is able to cut rates to remove restrictive monetary policy, you might find for the first time in a very long time, South Africa's GDP growth is driven by both investment and the consumer. So it can all look very pretty, but obviously what is going on at the same time? Risks, risks, risks. So you've got the election, you've got fiscal, you've got the global backdrop. Let me leave it there. Okay, that's a great opening. Thank you, Gina. That gives us lots to jump off from. Uh, Henny, you um, have a business that spans all of Africa, and there must be some extraordinary stories in that landscape uh, where you see some bright spots, you sp see some troubling spots. I'd be interested to know where you see the bright spots, where you see the troubling stuff, and how South Africa ranks in that. So uh, to, to do your free advertising, Henny tells me when I meet him for the first time, uh, DHL Express has a presence in more countries than the United Nations and Coca-Cola. You told me to go and Google it. I did. They do. <laughs> <laughs> that took the pressure off. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, where do I start answering that question? So I think, Generally, a little bit to Gina's story, I'm generally quite optimistic. Uh, why am I optimistic? Well, I'm in logistics, and for the world economy to turn, you need logistics. And we're there, and we're there to enable trade. And we've recently uh, launched a report, or published a report, that says that the trade in goods over 2022 actually outgrew GDP growth. And what does that tell us? It tells us that countries are resilient. Businesses are resilient. So the story of Africa, I think, is one of resilience. I think we've gone through so many shocks, uh, picking up from, from Gina's uh, introduction, that we've become accustomed to it, and we plan for it. You know, whether it's an election in South Africa, whether it's an election in Zambia, where Stavros have just returned from, it's, it's part and it's embedded in the business plan. So I think, you know, we, we kind of take that as it grows. I think there are lots of green shoots in Africa, and I think it relates a little bit to South Africa. I think South Africa needs to decide where it wants to play, and I would suggest that the African continent is a wonderful place for South Africa to play, and, and it's a big playground. I think there's, there's place for everybody. What are the green shoots? I think the agricultural sector is a massive green shoot for Africa. I think there's enormous potential in that, but I think as business we need to get into it, and public-private partnerships are important, <clears throat> I think, to uplift that and to, and to stimulate that growth. I think the mineral wealth that we have as a continent is enormous. It is absolutely gigantic, but as Africa, we've got to learn to find ways to add value onshore. Because what do we do? We export the raw product and we import the final product um, at, at a tremendous cost. And logistics plays an enormous part in that cost. Why? In Africa, more or less, the cost of logistics adds anything between 40 to 43 percent to the cost of the final good. And why is that? Well, it's because of the lack of infrastructure. If you talk about economies, where do we invest? Where does China invest, et cetera? Well, it's in our infrastructure. You know, we still do not have connectivity back uh, to pre-2019, uh, pre-COVID levels from an air connectivity point of view. We still only at about 85% of our air connectivity. What does it mean? It means that your logistic costs are going to get more expensive. So there's a clear business case for governments to absolutely up the ante to invest in infrastructure. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But we also have the Africa Free Trade Agreement, and the question is, what are we doing as South African companies to capitalize on it? What are we doing as private sector to drive that? What are we doing in the different forums that we're sitting in to ensure that we actually help enable that Africa Free Trade Agreement? You know, the intra-Africa trade, Adrian, as you know, is roughly about 17%. I, I guess it depends which, which publication you read. If you look at the, the Americas, um, it's about 53, 55%. You look at Europe, that's in the high 60s, maybe early 70s. 
So there's still an enormous opportunity. And then the final opportunity that I see is in the massive SME base that, that we have on this continent. Formally, you've got about 49 million odd SMEs registered on this continent. But the biggest part of the SMEs are not registered on this continent. Now, what does it mean? It means that they don't contribute to the fiscus in their different countries. They don't contribute to the fiscus. It means that there's not enough money to invest in the infrastructure. So I think, you know, if there's one thing I'd leave the audience with to, to ponder on is about what do we do to uplift those SMEs? Because that's how Africa will trade its, its way to, to prosperity, in, in my opinion. So I'll, I'll probably park it there for now. The, the, the mood is far too optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so we get bussy in. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> You're bringing in the pessimist in the <laughs> yeah. Give us the lay of the land. Um, very Take concerning. us to the sharp end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very concerning. Um, and I think it, 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 it was interesting. I was looking at the Bitvest results the other day, and it was interesting how David Shapiro captured it. You know, he says, due to the underlying economic conditions, even the strongest soldiers are starting to feel the pressure. And that is what we're experiencing. And that is where you started, Edwin. Mm -hmm. um, Aselo Metal is talking about retrenching 3,500 people. Mining houses, 35,000 people that they're retrenching. Um, Remgro came out in September saying that this is one of the most difficult trading environments they've seen in 28 years, I think they've said. APSA came out and they said this is the worst they've seen in 30 years. Um, and, and, and that has really been the theme. So it's that a is very somber. It is. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's actually very concerning. And when you look at what's what's behind this or what the reason of all of this is, three things are currently keeping CEOs awake at night uh, at the moment, Adrian. And this is what is the case today and it's going to be the case going into the short and medium term. It's the uncertainty, and I think Jenna has spoken to it, the uncertainty that we find in this environment. Uncertainty precipitated by the geopolitics Gina has spoken about started with Lady R. You know, as the South African mm. business community, we've never had to deal with the issue of geopolitics until Lady R happened. You know, and I was actually impressed at how the business community, I think, rose up, you know, to say that, President, you owe us an explanation in terms of what was that ship doing, docking in Simon's Town in December 22 with its transponder turned off. You know, obviously the Russia-Ukraine issue, there's the Israeli issue at the moment. You know, there is Am I allowed also... to ask you what you think it was doing? <laughs> I don't know what it was doing, but I can tell you now yeah. that the report that they gave us is utter rubbish. Okay. Yeah. No, it, 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 it says absolutely nothing, and there's obviously something we are not being told. Mm. But also, you know, it's, 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 it's very concerning what we are seeing from a BRICS perspective. BRICS being used as an instrument to drive the anti-West agenda. Where South Africa is at the moment, we need all the help we can get from anywhere that we can yeah. get it. We should be talking about the alternative to the West, you know, from a friend's perspective, not the anti-West. We can't choose, you know, who we get into. Yes, we can choose who we get into bed with, but we borrow two billion rands a day, every day as an economy. You know, that money doesn't come from the East. It comes mm. from the West. Mm. You know, the biggest trading partners that South Africa has at the moment is the West, it's not the East. You know, and that is going to be so for quite some time. There's absolutely nothing wrong with BRICS as a block, you know, because I think we understand well, hang on. what we're going we're to go to Mr. BRICS now. And, and yeah, Yes, you know, I know where uh, Stavros <laughs> is going. And Stavros agrees with me. There's absolutely nothing wrong with BRICS, but it can't be used as yeah. a tool against the West. That's wrong. Okay. Come you know? back to, you told me three things. So it's the uncertainty. Geopolitical uncertainty. So it's, it, 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 it's precipitated by geopolitics. It's precipitated by social instability. It's precipitated by the political risk that is going up and the country risk that is going up along with it. It is precipitated by the 2024 elections. Jenna has spoken to it, the coalitions. City of Joburg has had eight mayors in the last two years. If That's the city of Joburg eight mayors in the last two mm. years. So if what is happening at the city of Joburg is going to be escalating to national next year, then we're going to be sitting with a new president. 
every month. I don't know what that looks like. <laughs> Obviously, I'm, I'm exaggerating, you know, mm. but so it's the uncertainty. And then it's the deteriorating trading environment. You know, four network industries in this country, three of them are dysfunctional. Energy is dysfunctional. You know, um, Henny just spoke about the fact that the world, uh, for the world economy to turn, you need logistics. Logistics is dysfunctional. Okay, not from a DHL perspective, but Transnet is dysfunctional. <laughs> There's 71,000, I think they've cleared it now, they are saying 60,000. It's still bad, whichever way you choose to look at it. 60,000 containers sitting at the ports waiting to, it's a recipe for disaster. And when you look at what's happening at the Devon ports, 25 kilometers long queues of trucks yeah. waiting to offload their goods. Some of these goods are seasonal. What's going to happen? It's Christmas time. Are they going to get here in February? In which case, they're useless. You know, what is the impact of that going to be on businesses? So energy, transport, and logistics, water, depending where you're sitting in South Africa at the moment, water is already a crisis. The mm. only one that is functional is telecoms. And that is because someone had the sense to privatize telecom back in the day. So we therefore need to, you see, it doesn't matter which industry you're operating in. You need energy, you need to get your goods to market, you need water, and if we are failing at the very basics as a country, it becomes problematic, Adrian, because the president stood at the State of the Nation address and said, I'm trying to bring two trillion rands investment for the next five years. You therefore have to answer the question of what exactly is the business case for investing in South Africa at the moment? The v W brand chief guy the other day said, we are going to have to ask ourselves as VW at some point to say, yeah. why do we continue producing our goods from this market? And that is the sentiment that is coming across. So the deteriorating trading environment precipitated by the failure and the dysfunction of the four network industries. And then crime and corruption. But as far as crime and corruption, I'm not concerned. I'm, 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 I'm not surprised. Rather, I'm concerned, but not mm. surprised. I'm not surprised because we are naive, Adrian, as a country, to think that we can expect to see South Africans do differently when the message from the top is to, this fish called South Africa is rotten from the top. And if you want to deal with the issue of crime and crime, you can't have government officials, or maybe let me call them thieves, masquerading as government officials. It's a problem. And you don't see, and, and you don't see decisive, bold action being taken. But you see, there can be decisive and bold action from number one. Why? Two words. Pala, pal. Is that two words or one word? Right? Because you two have your own. You remember what Tabila saying? We all have our small anyana skeleton. <laughs> There's the small anyana skeleton coming out. And I think there is brazen looting happening at the moment. You know, we're talking to the chairman of the Public Service Commission who's been tasked with the professionalization of the public service. And I wish him luck. I don't know where he's going to begin to professionalize the public service. But he says what we are seeing from public officials right now, they are no longer messing around and filtering with ten does here and there, it is now brazen looting. Yeah. We therefore have to come to a point where we ask ourselves the question of what are we going, how are we going to intervene in as far as that is concerned. The GTOC report came out, the 2023 report the other day. South Africa is number one on something. I don't know what it is, but we are number one, mm. whatever crime in the country, number 19 in terms of the Numero Criminality Index, number three, most dangerous country in the world, number five, female homicide. We are making headlines for all the wrong reasons. So when I talk about the three main issues, and of course there are a whole lot more, but the reigning sentiment, you know, in terms of as we go into 2024, you know, uh, what are some of the things that we're going to have to contend with as the business community? It's definitely the uncertainty, the deteriorating, deteriorating, deteriorating trading environment and the crime and corruption. Okay, Stavros, so uh, Bussi sets the, the challenge. What's the investment case for South Africa? and uh, your perspective on BRICS or the big BRICS now? Uh, Adrian, firstly, after listening to Busi, I wish we played a Rugby World Cup final every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way I can try and lift myself out of that. You, you were there. But, uh, that must have been quite a moment. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is that I hardly ever disagree with Busi, and I'm not going to disagree with her today either, fortunately. I'd like to say one day we'll disagree and it will be fine. Yeah. But um, I can't really fault anything she said. But let, let, me, um, let me give you firstly my overall perspective. Because I'm a guy from pharma, 
I don't know much about economics and, and all the rest of it, but I, I've got a very simple measure, Adrian, of where we are. So if we are selling more antidepressants, then I know the economy is on a downward trajectory. And if we, if we sell more of the little blue pill, then I know we're on an upward trajectory. <laughs> okay. So I can tell you, we're overwhelmingly selling more antidepressants at the moment, right? I can tell you that with great certainty. Okay, so l let me just summarize, uh, just a prefacing remark, Adrian, and then I'll come into your two questions, right? The, the first thing is that we all know the picture of South Africa at the moment. We've had 15 years of pedestrian growth. That's been the real issue. We haven't grown at the levels we ought to grow. Now, many countries are in that position as well because there's a degree of relativity here. But when it is self-inflicted, as is the case here, then it's problematic. Because if, if you don't have the talent, you don't have the resources, you don't have the minerals, etc., and you're pedestrian, then maybe you can argue there's a case for being pedestrian. But we don't really have a case for being pedestrian, other than all of these issues are largely self-inflicted, unfortunately. So let me start answering your question around the role of business, and then I'll come to BRICS at the end. So we, when we face the current crises that we face, you can either stand by on the sidelines and watch the ship sail by, or you could say, the reality check is that government's capacity, capability, expertise, skills and talent has been completely hollowed out. It's been the case for a long time now. It's not anything new. Um, it's only the degree of uh, how worse it gets year on year that changes, actually. So we've taken, and, and Boosie is very much part of this, as is BLSA, we've taken a conscious decision, not without risk, as a business community to say that there's one SA Inc. And if we don't have the capacity and it's stifling the economy, we've identified three areas that are disenablers to growing the economy, which I'll come back to in a second. But we've taken that conscious decision with the risk that comes with it, because it does come with risk, that we will provide largely pro bono our expertise, capacity, and resource as business to try and rescue the situation. Otherwise, it's never going to be rescued. And then we'll be off the cliff. Some argue we are already off the cliff, but I, th I think we can still pull back. So in the midst of all of those comments I've made, uh, and, and speaking as, as a business person, I've never known a pessimist to solve any problem. So I think we've got to be realistic optimists here. And that realism means we, we've got to, as much as this deviates from our core businesses, we've got to make our resources and expertise and capacity available. And that is what gives me more than a glimmer of hope for the future, Adrian. Because I think we're all looking and saying, well, geez, <laughs> this guy's telling us his antidepressant sales are up. Boosie's saying, you know, I mean, you'll all want to go and take antidepressants after this. But... We've got to look at those touch points that give a glimmer of hope. And I think business's foray, and it's not new incidentally, because Bursi and others have been leveled lots of criticism to say, well, you've woken up now eight months before an election. That, that's not true, because Bursi will tell you, we, we started B4SA three years ago to help with the COVID crisis. And business is sincere about getting this economy back on track and on a different trajectory. And that's what gives me a lot of hope for the future. Now, let me just quickly touch on the theory. Can, can I just yeah. stop you there and say, we've heard that before. Well, I think, Adrian, uh, this is in a very different context, firstly, and in a very different governance structure with a completely different set of resources. Um, so the, the initiative has been going for about five months now. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a build-up to it, of course. This is the 115. Yeah, 135. Yeah. 135. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah. So we, we, we identified three disenablers. Of course, there are many disenablers. But we said these are the three most critical to set this economy on a different pathway. So number one is the in energy security. Number two is transport, logistics, infrastructure. And number three is crime and corruption. 
So we said those are the three areas. If we make inroads there, we can set the economy on a different pathway. Now, have there been some breakthroughs? We've been going for five months. Do we expect to turn things around completely in five or even in 12 months? The answer is no. But you've got to look at incremental progress. Okay, and with that incremental progress, Boosie will tell you, has also come a lot of disappointment. Okay, but incremental progress there is, and that's what's important to focus on. So, Emma, could you give us any sort of practical examples? Or so, like Gina, I'm also fairly uh, convinced that the energy crisis will be largely a thing of the past by the end of 2024. Not because I've got great hope in Eskom, but because the independent producers are coming in. So if you're asking me for, for, I mean, su for, for success stories... The, the energy sector was privatized with the lifting of the cap, right? It, it was. And I, I think for once you've got to give government credit there. Because probably the single most, intervention, the most, single most important intervention by President Ramaphosa in the midst of all these crises, is when he opened up the energy sector. Mm. Okay. He needs to open it up further. There's the ERA that's serving before various uh, uh, parliamentary committees at the moment. I think that will change our world dramatically. But opening it up has allowed us to generate another 4,800 megawatts. So if you're looking at tangible successes, I know that when you're sitting in stage six, you know, well, where is this? But the fact remains, almost 5,000 megawatts, and there's more coming. So those are kind of the tangible things that we can look at. Now, on the rail and logistics, did we expect Transnet to go off the cliff? We, we actually did, because this is not a one-year or two-year in the making. Mm. It's been 10 years in the making. So literally since Maria Ramos left, and I sat on that Transnet board when Maria ran the company, and she ran it efficiently, since Maria left, the wheels, excuse the pun, have come off right. And we're not uh, surprised at all because of what's happened. But I think you've got to look at the initiatives al aligning a, 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 a rail transport strategy for the country, um, aligning it with further deregulation, allowing private sector to come in. Those are all very positive steps, but they're not going to give you a result today. They will in the medium term. And that's where we've got to how so long is the medium term? Medium term is two to three years, Adrian, unfortunately. But there is incremental change happening in between. So let me go to the last issue, which is, which is crime and corruption. So I think that is probably the area we are most disappointed in. Um, are we disappointed in the NPA? Of course, I'm stating the obvious. There's not a single person in this room who will stand up and say, listen, they're doing a, a great job, because they're not. And a lot of our foreign investor hopes actually hinged on how we addressed corruption because that's one of the single biggest reasons investors don't come here. They're saying, well, I'm going to put my money in here, it's going to go into a black hole. Okay. And a lot of us five years ago had great hope in the NPA and they've let us down regrettably. So providing capacity at an arm's length independently and objectively from the private sector to assist is an area that we are looking at. Because you start changing the narrative, you change the sentiment towards the company from foreign investors. Okay. Now, Lastly, let me go on to BRICS for a minute. So like, like Boosie, for me, and I, I'm sorry if you've heard this from me before, uh, you know, Henry Kissinger once said, uh, America has no friends, it only has interests. And I'm afraid that's how you've got to look at it. And our interests lie in the West, they lie in the East, and they lie in the South, which is largely Africa. And we've got to straddle that line and navigate the road to ensure that we are able to, with a free conscience, completely unencumbered, transact, commercialize, and invest with all three of those regions because they all present business opportunity and prospect for this country. So that's a very clear message from business. And I think business has been successful in that area because I, I had uh, occasion to meet the, the um, Ukrainian foreign minister. He was out here two weeks ago. And, and he said to me, what a turnaround. I had a one-on-one -on -one with him. He said, well, what a turnaround. 
He said, do you know President Ramaphosa and Zelensky actually have a great relationship today? And that trip to Ukraine made a big difference. But I'll tell you, a lot of pressure came from business to get that narrative and that message. So I was shocked listening to him because he said to me, great relationship, we're trying to get the two of them together before the end of the year, don't know if it will happen, small matter of electioneering. But business has played its role and business's posture and stance is very clear. We've got to go where our best interests lie. And they lie in all three of those areas. Concluding comment, Adrian. Have a look at how India have managed their geopolitics. So India has been buying discounted oil and gas from Russia. Okay. Didn't become embroiled in geopolitics. Not a word said about India. And India should be singled out, right? And India is the shining star at the moment on the international platforms. We haven't even bought discounted oil from Russia. But look at the flak we've taken. So there's a message and a lesson in all of that, Adrian. So just to conclude, do I think we're going to start selling less antidepressants soon? My outlook is a 24-month outlook, unfortunately. We'll be done with the election. A provocation is that are you better off without a coalition? We probably are. Okay. But we're looking at that 24-month horizon. And then I think the blue pools will start picking up again. Thanks very much. Thanks, Stavros. The, <clears throat> so, Jean, I want to wheel back to you. Um, yeah, I wanted to comment on something oh, that okay. Stavros said. <laughs> Let me have a go first. Okay. <laughs> So first, I mean, you spoke about the global landscape and a small open economy, South Africa, um, is highly influenced, dependent, reliant on global circumstance. I'm keen to know your views on the moderation of inflation. Is the worst behind us? We're not going to see double digit again uh, from the advanced economies. Uh, does that mean the top of the interest rate cycle globally? And uh, in that, uh, in that bucket, what are the prospects of a soft landing? I mean, this sounds like you know, the Loch Ness monster. So keen to get those and your response to Stavros. Uh, yeah, look, I think in a nutshell, as economists love soft landing, hard landing, our global view, it'll, it'll be a soft landing. We're not seeing a deep protracted recession, especially coming out of the US. Like I mentioned with central bankers, and I think this is what haunts all of us economists, is that, you know, our projections are only as good as the past. So what we can see looking back in the past, inflation generally, is that if we don't have a huge supply side constraint or supply side shock, either globally, which is usually oil prices, oil. Yeah. Um, or obviously locally, depending on regional or, or countries themselves, then inflation should decline. You know, it's, so yes, the worst is behind us. I think where it gets trickier is convincing those central bankers who seem to have become hawkishly dovish, if that makes sense. So they, they know that at some point they'll be reducing rates, but they are absolutely terrified to admit that right now or to even think about it. Because you've had some who also, I wouldn't say prematurely, but you've had, I mean, I, I cover South Africa, but I also look after the whole Samir region, so Central Eastern Europe, Middle East Africa. And you've had some central banks that already started to cut and now are going, whoa, hang on, maybe we were little moving a little soon. bit too soon. Yeah. So you're, it's never good to be a first mover as a central banker, and that's why they all are very cautious by nature. They're so much out of our control. Um, so I do so think the worst the is behind comes, us. Sorry, if the lead comes from the US, I'm hearing you say that, when do they cut? The US, middle yeah. of next year. Middle of next yeah. year. And, and look, okay. for South Africa, again, I want to touch wood when I say these things. Um, we do think that it's a bit of a bumpy ride for inflation in the beginning parts of next year. There's some... Not, this is nothing for us to discuss, but there's some medical aid surveys that are changing around that will cause some base effects. But once we get past the election, and we can talk about scenarios there, and this is also assuming the election is in the second quarter, and let's also assume there's no ma major country risk premium attached to FX at the time, inflation should, by the end of next year, be back at 4.5%. 
Okay. Why I, I don't say that with huge amounts of conviction is that that's also what we thought last year, right? But then load shedding created more inflation. The oil price came out and surprised us. So or again, all these supply chain, mm -hmm. supply chain constraints come out and, and, and keep us very But we'll cautious. have you back again and you can say four and a half. <laughs> Maybe back in six months. <laughs> that's better. But um, I, I just wanted to, on the geopolitics, and this is, I mean, it is so very complex and complicated. But South Africa has certainly made it overly complicated for itself. Mm. I mean, we are a very small economy. And yes, all of our trade, all of our investment flows generally come from the West. I'm not saying it's, it's a bad thing to sit and mature as a democracy and think to yourself, where's the world headed? Who should we align to in the future? But start doing it from an economic perspective first which means you do it gently and gradually, exactly as how Stavros yeah. explained it. There's nothing wrong with being part of BRICS, you know, trying to make your little S a bit bigger on the end. Nothing wrong with that. But why weigh in on global conflict? Yeah. Why do you have to be so vocal on wars? I mean, what is there to gain other than people worried that you're cozying up to someone um, and really trying to make your small S a bit a bit bigger on the bricks. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's the problem with the yeah. country risk premium and then it weighs on FX and FX comes with commodity prices, mm -hmm. oil prices, it becomes inflationary. And then you've got imported inflation. Why is our South Africa Reserve Bank governor so utterly frustrated with government? I think that's the answer to, you know, why inflation is a problem, why they're so reluctant to cut rates, you know, why they have to do the heavy lifting all the time. It's just, it's a very difficult environment to be in already, but for some reason we just want to overcomplicate it. Mm. So, and, and India, their response in, in buying oil from Russia was economics. Again, it mm. wasn't them standing, taking a stand and saying, well, we're going to get involved in, you know, the war that we don't have to be a part of. So that again was very economics. And then just one last comment also on investment. When we say reduced load shedding, we're not talking about eradicated load shedding. Renewables has been great. We're talking about a country that has been in stage four to six that can hopefully move to stages one to three. You know, I mean, again, I'm an economist. I'm expected to predict something like load shedding. You know, even ESCOM doesn't know how much load shedding they're going to do. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we can't get this right. Because you have, to get it right in the end, you have to know how much load shedding there'll be to know what the impact is on the economy. And even trying to work out the impact on the economy is near impossible. So again, we can use what we know from last year. We can mm. use what we know from now, the re nurse registrations, the pipeline from the presidency. And soil is fantastic, but you still need base load. Mm. So we will still have a degree of load shedding, but I think, again, we are a resilient nature. Africa is also known as being resilient. Consumers feel better when there's stage one to three going on. And then they feel irate when it's stage four to six. So if you can keep stage one to three next year, it's better. Mm -hmm. The problem for investment, and, and this is what I want to, and, and maybe Busi and Henny can definitely weigh in on this from a corporate perspective. The investment so far looks great in the data. You know, we look at the GDP numbers from Q2 and go, oh, this is wonderful. You know, it's all renewables. But why are companies investing in, re in renewables? In order to grow or in order to not go backwards? So they're investing to stand still. But you still. know, that's also imported infrastructure. No, absolutely. Equipment. But exactly. I mean, from a balance of payments perspective, you import more, your current account gets bigger. And usually if you're importing for um, in investment Good for, for infrastructure, you're supposed to um, attract flows. Mm. Because let's just say, you know, a listed company tells its shareholders, well, we're investing in renewables. And usually, the, the, you know, shareholders say, oh, well, that's fantastic. You know, you're doing investment. This is going to give you long-term growth. And so they invest more into the company. You know, they buy more stock. But now they're doing it standstill. So you're not necessarily going to attract those investment flows unless that investment becomes more than just renewables. Henny, if there's 54, 55, or 56 African countries, how many have you been to? Uh, just on about 35. Okay. Yeah. It's quite a few. If you were to import policy from one of those countries, which one would it be? Who can South Africa learn from in the neighborhood and why? 
That is a great question, and I'm afraid I don't, I don't have a single answer for you. I think, I think there are pockets of brilliance uh, across Africa. I think Botswana, uh, our neighbor, if you look at how they've done, if you look at how they're faring on the democracy index, for example, they, they're far better than South Africa. If you look at the, the stock exchange and how it's performed versus ours, they've done better. Um, so I think you know, there's some examples we can learn from that. I think we can learn from Mauritius in terms of how they're trying to position themselves uh, from a macroeconomic point of view. They're trying to position themselves as a mini Singapore of Africa, also doing better on, the, on both the democracy index as well as the corruption uh, index, certainly doing better than us. I think a breath of fresh air for me right now is the Kenyan government. I think that the Kenyan government has become very receptive to the voice of business. And certainly the way we experience them is incredibly positive. We don't have to kick down doors or be part of a 135 signatory page in order to get the attention. We, we get invited, business gets invited in there. And I think they're also focusing on the right things in the economy, and I'm not an economist like Gina, but certainly if I look at where they're paying their focus and attention to, I would hazard a guess and say it's absolutely the right thing. Um, I think that's probably where I will cap that answer. For, for now. The, the good news is that they're all close by, you know, we don't have to go to a Francophone Africa and I think there's probably a, a little bit of, of, of um, a, a bright light there, but probably not as bright as I perceive it to be uh, in East and Southern Africa and Indian Ocean. And uh, just on the way in here, we were talking about Zambia. Um, you've been there recently? I have been. What's going on there? So, so I think Zambia is still the tale that has to evolve and, and unfold. You know, the comment I made over coffee is if half of what their president says is true, then I think that's great. I think if they then only implement half of the half that is true, then I think they'll have a great trajectory. They have got issues. If you look at the copper belt, uh, you know, Stavros, you've just been there. there. There are infrastructural issues there. But there is an incredible opportunity and they realize that. There's an incredible opportunity in the agri-market, and they realize that. You know, he's put out some wonderful challenges to, to the business community and, and to the local community. So I'm, I'm a bit uh, about it. And again, you know, we've all mentioned it. Africa, as a continent, is incredibly resilient. I do think what we lack is a single voice or a common voice. I think there's still a long way to go in terms of that. What, where does that lead us from a South African perspective? I think we, we are already being overtaken by some of the other African nations and potentially economies. And again, I'll let Gina weigh, weigh in on that one. Um, but certainly in terms of their thinking from a government point of view, from a policy point of view, I think we are being overtaken. You know, we're getting embroiled in all sorts of sideshows uh, rather than to fo focus on, on the core issues at hand. And you know, what is the core issue? You know, somebody made win mention of, of war. There are no winners in war. It doesn't matter who raises the flag. Let me tell you, there are no winners. So what's the antidote? Trade is the only antidote to war. It is the only antidote. And that's why I think business is so important. That's why I think uh, focus meetings like this is am as important. And then just the last thing, you know, what, what often kind of gets me a little bit excited is we often talk about the war that's happening in Europe or the war that's happening in Israel. I don't hear anybody talk about what's going on in Africa, all the coup d'etats that are happening. Five, which is at a a coup d'etat that thankfully, well, I don't know if it's thankfully, but it didn't work in Sierra Leone. We've got Sudan that's been at war for goodness knows how long. You know, as Africans, we, we've got to pay a little bit more focus in terms of what's happening on our continent and focus our energies on there, because I think that's where the economic opportunity to some degree, if not a large degree, lies. And there's a red war belt that stretches all the way from west to east Africa um, in the northern uh, be, very much so, and I'm personally quite concerned about what's happening. Which must happening. make it incredibly, sorry, I mean, incredibly difficult for your business well, in that part of the world. You know, war is difficult for, for logistics. You know, if you think about, if you think about Niger, where, where we had the coup not, not too long ago, what, what does it mean from a logistics perspective? It means that you can't fly over that country, it's a no-fly zone. What does it mean? It means that you've got to fly around, or you've got to go higher. It means more fuel, it means less load capacity. What happens is your cost per kilo becomes more expensive. Who pays the price? The consumer. What's happening between Ukraine and Russia? It's actually forced the Middle East to suddenly pop up as a, as a, as a transit hub. You know, suddenly you see all the traffic from Asia, where it used to fly across, now hubbing via, via the Middle East. What does it mean? It means 
an hour and a half extra flying time, more fuel as I've already said, it means a day extra on transit time. That is difficult with an economy that's struggling and that's stuttering at the moment. Um, you, you know, that certainly has got, got an impact on it. That's why terms such as nearshoring and onshoring is becoming kind of, you know, very relevant in boardrooms today. And then the last thing I would just say on that is this, this fast retail that's emerged suddenly, you know, you know the, the sheens of this world, you know, sheen has taken the world by storm. It has a massive impact on retailers. That's why the TFG group has just forced their um, textile company to onshore in Durban. So a lot of fallout from wars, but equally a lot of opportunities uh, from that perspective. If business can do one thing, what would it be? You know, I, I, I think business is already doing it, and I think we can do more of it, you know, and I think Stavros already started to speak to it. The realization that the South African problems are not government's problems, they are precisely that, South Africa's problems. And if they are South Africa's problems, then it means they are our problems as well as business. Business as the only social partner with disproportionate resources has got a responsibility to try and answer the question, of how are we going to utilize our disproportionality for the betterment of the citizens of this country. The Edelman Trust Barometer came out this year and said 62% of South Africans are saying they trust business more than government. There's a huge responsibility that has been placed on us as business, and we also have to answer the question of what are we going to do with the trust that has mm. been placed on business. So the business-government collaboration that you see happening at the moment, when President stood in front of the nation last year in August and unveiled the electricity crisis plan that was supposed to end load shedding and set up NECOM, they didn't have a plan in terms of how they are going to resource NECOM, how they are actually going to capacitate it, and so forth and so forth. The 100 million rands had to come from business, 25 million of that coming from PLSA to capacitate NECOM so that we can give effect to the plan that the president put in place. We have now established NLCC, which is the equivalent of NECOM, National Logistics Crisis Committee, 120 million rands that is required to capacitate the NLCC so that we can solve the problems of transnet is coming from business, 25 million of that again is coming from PLSA. You know, we have given the NPA 15 million rands worth of resources to assist with the capacitation so that we can seek successful prosecutions because we know, and I think um, the, the Reserve, governor, uh, Reserve Bank governor was talking to that, that the longer we stay on the grey listing as a country, it doesn't augur well for us. And when you look at the FATF report says, Adrian, their biggest concern, two biggest concerns, is it cannot be that so many millions of rands were siphoned out of the state for so many years, and you haven't put a single person in jail. Mm. It shows how weak the criminal justice system is. And it's weak from beginning to end. We either can't identify these people, if we have identified that them, there isn't enough processing or there isn't the right processing that happens in the system. And like Matsila Koko now he has gotten off, you know, the case has been struck off the roll, or you are just failing to take a strong enough case to the court so that you can be able to prosecute these people. So it was the prosecutions and it was the issue of beneficial ownership. So FATF is coming back again, uh, January 2025, um, Gina, I think is our, so we therefore have to get our house in order. We only have 12 months as a country to show that uh, we have made enough and demonstrable progress to ensure, you know, that uh, we can hopefully get off FATF or whatever the case is. Short so answer, do you is, think we can get off? I don't have short answers. I don't know how to talk No, short. you have to just say yes or no. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. think... Yes or no? No. You think we can get off? Short answer, yes, no. It's how many economists have uh, two no. hands, eh? I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, no, I worry we won't. Okay. Um, I'm interrupting you, Bussy. I'm keen to know before my, my time's run out. Um, two parts in NHI. Uh, NHI, what? I'll, I'll take NHI. NHI. Yeah. Should I come in now? Two parts. Go for it. And okay. two parts, yeah. Okay. Right. So, 
we are unfortunately in electioneering mode. And uh, during an election, election machinery takes over. And, and logic doesn't always prevail, regrettably. Okay. So we're in that situation right now. So business's view is a very clear one. I mean, Boosie could have answered this as well as I can, because business is absolutely united in its stance vis-a-vis NHR. NHR will further worsen the healthcare plight of the poor in the country. We're very clear on that. Why do I say that? Because we need the best of the private sector and the best of the public sector. And I'm not saying that the public sector is all bad. There's some fantastic uh, scientists and professors and academic hospitals in this country. So you need the private and the public sector to work together. The NHR bill in its present form distances the two. And that's the biggest issue we've got as business. Now, our second big issue is that we've learned some hard lessons during COVID. And, and we know that you can't just gloss over health care issues any longer. We did. They were kind of for the doctors, let the doctors all deal with it. Then we saw all the economic fallout from, from pandemics. So there's a new focus on health care. And what we are saying is to improve the productivity and efficiency of this country, you've got to have a well-oiled, well-functioning health care system that includes both the private and the public sector working alongside each other, not trying to collapse the one into the other. And so in summary, Adrian, with all the faults that lie in the bill, the NHR bill, business is supportive of the bill, provided there are certain amendments made. And the most manifest amendment is something called Section 33, which will continue medical aids to uh, the existence of medical aids. Section 33 in its present form will mean at a point in time you will cede your funding. I don't know how lawful this is, but it's on the table. You will cede all your funding. So whatever your medical aid reserves are, they were transferred to the state. So that's like expropriation. Right? So that's the problem we've got. Is Section 33, fix 33, the good parts in the bill, and then we can work with government as we are working with them in the other three areas. Okay, thank you. Two links here with the two-part system. Go for it. It's an electioneering year that we're going into. Um, the two-part reti retirement system is nothing new for us locally in South Africa. It's been discussed for a very long time, but there was also a very good reason why Treasury was trying to only have it implemented in 2025. Just before you do this, Gina, I know this is brutally unfair, but for those who don't know, why don't you just explain what the two-part means? So you basically take your retirement, uh, retirement fund, all funds, and it's going to be split into one-third or going into your savings account, two-thirds, typical retirement fund that you always had. And individuals of those pension, the owners, the beneficiaries um, of those pension funds will be able to access on an annual basis 10% of the savings or capped at 30,000 Rand per, per year. So as soon as this was announced that this was going to potentially happen on the 1st of March 2024, locals had already known about it, but were uh, maybe terrified is maybe a strong word, depending on how strong you want to go, but nervous because you're preparing for something that is now going to happen a year earlier. The system's in place. There, I mean, Parliament, I don't even know how it can get to this. It doesn't look as if it could be implemented on the 1st of March at the moment, but they are pushing very hard. It will put cash, it could, could put cash in consumers' pockets, which is a good thing before an election. Um, Offshore investors. But a bad thing for life. Well, yeah, I'm getting to this impact. Yeah. Offshore investors looked at this and said, what on earth? You know, this is like, what on earth is South Africa doing? And immediately, because they cover many emerging markets, went to the LATAM example. During COVID, where Chile, Peru, Bolivia, all mm. did this. And you saw credit downgrades. You've seen a deterioration in their pension fund system. You've got their countries asking for more access. It has not been a good outcome. If you speak to local pension funds who are gearing for this, it is a way that can work in a vacuum. Remember, we always do things in a vacuum to say, but it'll give consumers more flex, something to fall back on because they had nothing in COVID. Think about what we just said about NHI. 
when you get older, and now you've accessed, because of course South Africans will access it in general, but now you get older, you have left, less left at the end of the day, and unless we get a huge improvement in public services in this country, particularly health, what is your aging population going to be like? The impact in the near term, sure, well, look, we, again, you're going to get some very clever people out there who will claim they know exactly how many people will access this and exactly what the impact is. But to cite the South Africa Reserve Bank just last Friday in an investor session, no one knows exactly how many people will access it. But what we do know is that consumers in South Africa like to spend. So you're going to have some form of access. No one knows exactly how much. What does that do? It boosts consumption. If it's sufficient to boost consumption in quite a big way, that'll boost GDP growth. It might actually result in slightly higher household savings rate, because we don't save, because potentially you don't have to dip into other types of savings. It might mean that consumers don't need as much credit, so it could com compromise credit appetite. It all depends on how large this is in scale. But then, you know, swings and roundabouts, the more consumption that there is, the more it invites demand pull inflation. The Saab looks at this and says, oh, now we've got a demand inflation risk. Inflation doesn't come down as, as much as it could. The Saab doesn't cut as much as possible. So it could actually offset mm. the, the near-term boost to growth. But the medium to long-term is, I think, where everyone looks at this and thinks to themselves, but if already those who are reaching pension age in South Africa don't have sufficient funds, how on earth will they have sufficient funds if they're able to access it earlier? in the absence, of course, of growth and job growth. So do the magical things, create jobs and growth, you'll be fine. We've seen that story.